Hello and thank you for tuning in to Memo's Weekly Review with me, Nassim Ahmed, and my regular guest, Moin Robani. Hello, Moin. Good to see you again. Oh, it's good to see you, Nassim. Um, so I want to begin this week um, with the Balfour Declaration. Uh, this show, actually, this uh, weekly review we've been running now, I think it's our 40th episode. And... Um, We've spoken so much about Gaza and we will speak about Gaza as well, but we've never really spoken about the historical context. I want to begin this week by speaking about the historical context. And I thought there's no better time than in the in the in the month of the anniversary of the uh, infamous Balfour Declaration. So we'll begin with that and then we'll do our tour of the Middle East and Gaza in particular. Uh, and then we'll finish with a conversation uh, regarding the US election and the possibility of an Iranian strike during the time of the election, what kind of impact that may have. But let's begin, as I said, you know, um, with the Balfour Declaration. Mm -hmm. um, you you issued a tweet uh, to mark the occasion yourself. Um, I just want to get your thoughts first, um, and then, then I'll add my comments about it as well. But let's, let's discuss the Balfour Declaration and why... It's a, a significant moment for the Palestinians and not just Palestinians, the region as a whole. Yeah. Well, for Palestinians, um, November has always been a month of commemorations. You have the commemoration of the Balfour Declaration on November 2nd, uh, the proclamation of Palestinian statehood on uh, November 15th. That was in 1988. And then um, November 29th, you have... Um, the commemoration of uh, the United Nations General Assembly's partition resolution, and which is now also um, the, the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. There may be one or two others I'm forgetting. But the Balfour Declaration, um, issued on the 2nd of November 1917, is a document of paramount importance because um, it can the case can arguably be made that without the British commitment to the implementation of the Zionist program that was proclaimed by the, by the uh, Balfour Declaration, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today because all the key developments that came during the rest of the 20th century and indeed do, during the 21st were essentially um, dependent on Great Britain seizing control of Palestine in the aftermath of the First World War and imposing the Zionist program on Palestine by force of arms. Uh, left without imperial sponsorship and sponsorship not only of an imperial power, but of what was then the most powerful state on earth, uh, Zionism would have probably ended up in the dustbin of history as yet one more um, uh, utopian nationalist project that came to nothing. Um, the Zionism did not have the power, did not have the means to independently impose itself on Palestine and the Palestinian people. Uh, therefore, from the very outset of uh, the Zionist movement in the late 1890s, it put extraordinary effort into securing an imperial patron. That was finally achieved in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration, which um, committed uh, Great Britain to the establishment of what it called a Jewish national home in Palestine. Um, that declaration in turn was uh, incorporated into the 1922 League of Nations mandate awarded by the League of Nations uh, to Britain. And without British control over Palestine, what the preeminent Palestinian historian Walid al-Khalidi has called the British shield, um, Zionism could not have succeeded in establishing a Jewish state in Palestine, by which um, uh, one should go with the Zionist definition of a Jewish state, a state in which the Jewish community uh, achieves demographic, territorial, and political hegemony. In other words, the transformation of the Arab territory of Palestine into an exclusivist um, Jewish state. Okay. Um, um, yes, I mean, I, I think the point you make is um, 
really important that without the Balfour Declaration, I don't think we would be discussing the ethnic cleansing and the genocide uh, of Gaza. And I think on a wider point, uh, something many people miss out when they discuss the Balfour Declaration is that in all likelihood, um, Middle East would have been a very different Middle East. Um, Palestinian refugees would not have emerged as a, a political actor in, in, in the region. Uh, new Arab states uh, would not have had to manage a humanitarian catastrophe that was Palestinian refugees in 1948, which was way beyond their capacity. So these new nations were burdened with problems which was way beyond the capacity. So that's, that's another issue. And I, I also think we wouldn't be speaking about uh, the West committing itself to this garrison state, uh, the state of Israel, uh, whose domination of the region that, that you know they were really committed to. Um, so there's all these other implications of the Balfour Declaration, which we don't really point out. And I don't think we would be seeing the US so... Uh, the Israeli lobby in the US, in the UK, in uh, and elsewhere, have so committed to a project in the Middle East or trying to control and dominate the Middle East in the way they are without uh, Israel being so central to their uh, he hegemony. So the Balfour Declaration, yes, for the Palestinians, but for the region, but also domestically in the US and in the UK as well, it's been such a catastrophe, which I think people fail to um, um, comprehend. Yeah. Um, Moving on from that, um, uh, let's turn, as we normally do, I mean, we speak a lot about Gaza and we've spoken about... As we should. Uh, as we should, because there is a ongoing genocide. And if we don't speak about the ongoing genocide, then who would? And, it's, you know, new details are emerging that Israel, there is a blueprint for an ethnic cleansing of Gaza, northern Gaza. And, and, and there's a constellation of you know actors from generals to settlers to various organizations who are actually implementing that plan and that plan was um highlighted by plus 972 magazine who has been doing amazing work over the past year exposing yes. uh many of the uh genocidal practice of the israeli state and last week also uh the un secretary general antonio gutierrez he also came out and warned of a of ethnic cleansing in northern gaza as have many others so what, what's the state of uh play at the moment in northern gaza we know there is um, as i said many have spoken about the ethnic cleansing that's taking place and details of that is emerging more and more as we uh you know um go through this uh, genocide well, it's it's hard to overstate the catastrophe that is being inflicted upon uh, the northern parts of uh, of the Gaza Strip, as as you mentioned, um, plus nine seven two, uh, the Israeli electronic magazine um, did an outstanding report on Israel's plan, and I think it's uh, titled um, "Exterminate, Expel, and Something Else." Um, Antonio Guterres, unfortunately very much a latecomer to the party, uh, is now also uh, raising the alarm. And recently a number of UN agencies uh, pointed out that every single individual in the northern Gaza Strip is at risk of dying. I mean, Israel is bombing um, uh, the entrances to clinics, which with its approval, have been identified as locations where um, children can receive urgently needed polio vaccines. It is uh, bombing children and others who are in the process of collecting water because it has cut off all food, water, uh, medical, electricity, and food, uh, f fuel supplies to the Northern Gaza Strip. It has bombed every one of the hospitals in that territory, including most recently a maternity ward and a children's ward within um, Kamal Adwan Hospital were directly uh, targeted. But this has become so normalized and such a accepted pattern of Israeli conduct that it barely rated a mention in the mainstream media. And the bombing is said to be constant and incessant. And every day we're hearing about a new massacre. Um, uh, the intensity of casualties in the northern Gaza Strip since this offensive began um, in, in, I believe it was in early October, is 
virtually unprecedented, even by the scale of what Israel has been doing throughout the Gaza Strip uh, during the past year. It has essentially sealed off the northern Gaza Strip from uh, the central and southern parts of the territory, the so-called Natsirim Corridor. And it has now also bisected the northern Gaza Strip so that you have uh, Jabalia refugee camp, Jabalia town, Beit Lahia and Beit Hanun, um, which are the most northern parts of the Gaza Strip, isolated from Gaza City to its south. And it's engaging in a campaign of what can only be described uh, systematic killing systematic destruction, systematic siege, and systematic deprivation of the very basic essentials of life. And its purpose, I think, is um, uh, not only to try to defeat uh, Hamas, um, one would think a relatively simple task for an army as powerful as Israel, but one which uh, in which it is encountering uh, growing challenges and a growing uh, body count for its soldiers, but to entirely empty the northern Gaza Strip of any Palestinian life, um, raising it to the ground, expelling or killing all those who were there, you know, conducting these mass arrests and, and, and placing numbers on uh, drawing numbers on the foreheads of detainees and something, you know, this, this really um, is very reminiscent uh, of, of the Warsaw Ghetto uh, during the Second World War. There's really uh, no need to mince words about this. Um, what is happening in the northern Gaza Strip, something we know about thanks to the extraordinary um, uh, courage and heroism and dedication and commitment of the few Palestinians who are still operating in that territory and who are also being uh, targeted and killed, uh, by the way. It's is, is really beyond words. And as with the rest of this genocide, Israel's chief allies and sponsors have decided um, uh, to treat it with either active support by making repeated statements that they support Israel's right of self-defense. Um, in other words, redefining genocide as a legitimate act of self-defense um, or otherwise uh, passively acquiescing in, in what Israel is doing by not only not imposing any consequences on Israel for its conduct, as is the case, for example, with the European Union, but ensuring that there will be no consequences by anyone else uh, for Israel for this uh, genocidal rampage. Hmm. Uh, Israel, of course, is also carrying out systematic uh, starvation. Um, that's one of the other um, crimes it's committing in northern Gaza. And not only is it stopping aid from going in, it's also bombing food depots, you know, bombing storage places where food depots, is pharmaceutical um, everything. stock, everything. Yeah, and, everything. And, 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 and the Plus 972 magazine, um, it went on to say that what's happening is worse than the general's plan. We've spoken about the general's plan, yes. uh, and it's more sinister, more brutal, more bloody. And um, I, I would recommend everyone to go and read that um, article just to understand the sheer devastation. And while Israel carries out its genocide in Gaza, one of the things it's been doing over the last year is questioning the casualty figures mm -hmm. and trying to present uh, the number of deaths in Gaza as though this is the average across all major conflicts uh, in an urban area. And it's, it's rolled out a number of so-called experts from the US and elsewhere to uh, provide some kind of legitimacy to Israel's um, genocidal campaign, saying, no, Israel's not killing as many people as you say. The proportion is more or less the same. And now it turns out there's a new report. Of course, we've always known this, but there's a new report that's just come out to say that, no, the killing in Gaza, the, the destruction in Gaza uh, as, as a ratio is way more than anything we've seen in any other conflict. So while Israel presents its the death toll as 50-50, 50% Hamas fighters, 50% civilians, now it turns out, according to a report by Action on Armed Violence, that 74% of people killed are civilians. So I mean, just want to get your thoughts on this new report and how that kind of debunks, I mean, every single Israeli argument yes. has been debunked, but how this also now debunks the Israeli uh, narrative. Well, it's, it's a very important um, uh, report uh, produced by Matthew Cockerill for, as you mentioned, Action on Armed Violence, AOAV, 
available on uh, on their website, written in plain English. I would encourage everyone to read it and judge uh, for themselves. And what he's basically done is, um, first of all, determined the credibility of the casualty figures that are provided by um, the Gaza, the Ministry of Health in the Gaza Strip, and demonstrates how they have repeatedly proven to be credible and accepted by cre as, as credible by um, uh, any external party that's relevant, um, including you know, the Americans and the Israelis and others. Then he's broken them down by age and sex, and on that basis has assumed that all infants, um, uh, children under, I can't remember which age, um, women and senior citizens can all by definition be considered civilian non-combatants. Um, and then there are two age groups of men um, that contain both combatants and non-combatants. And by looking at the proportion in past uh, conflicts in the or past Israeli assaults on, on the Gaza Strip and extrapolating from that, he has arrived at a conservative figure, as he puts it, of 74% civilian casualties. Uh, this, of course, directly contradicts what we've been hearing from Israeli apologists and hacks like John Spencer and, uh, and Andrew Fox, who have spent the past year telling us, you know, that never in human history has an army um, gone out of its way to prevent civilian casualties and care for civilians, you know, and provide them with caviar and filet mignon and all the rest of it, as has Israel in, uh, in the Gaza Strip. And they have um, come up with this absurd figure they've concocted out of thin air that the uh, proportion of um, uh, combatant to non-combatant uh, uh, casualties is one to one. In other words, that 50% of casualties are uh, combatants. And um, what's the other part that's interesting about the study, it has also been endorsed by Professor Paul Spagat, someone who has in the past uh, been skeptical of these figures, but has looked at Cockerill's study and um, uh, endorsed it. And he's one of the leading global experts on the issue of uh, calculating uh, civilian casualties. And he's also previously, in fact, um, taken issue with what these apologists like Spencer and Fox um, uh, have, have been writing about Israeli conduct. And, in the Gaza Strip. I mean, the long and short of it is you can't be engaged in a genocidal campaign and at the same time not only claim to be the most moral army in the world, but also claim that what is happening is unprecedented in terms of um, constraints the army is placing on itself to avoid civilian casualties. I think uh, Fox, I believe it was, um, uh, recently got a guided tour of uh, of the genocide in um, uh, in the northern Gaza Strip by the Israeli military and put out this sob story about how um, uh, you know these these Israeli soldiers uh, feel this is a job that must be done. They're full of empathy and sympathy for those who they are slaughtering on mass uh, and so on. Of course, directly contradicted by what what these soldiers and officers and politicians are themselves posting on social media, but it just shows how morally bankrupt, um, uh, how scholarly bankrupt, uh, how um, the, the extraordinary level of, of cowardice uh, and apologia that, that these people in their ilk are engaged in. So I think, you know, what Cockerill has done is, 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 is very important because once again, um, uh, this is someone who has looked at the data, um, studied it, knows his stuff, has provided a very uh, detailed analysis to substantiate his conclusions, and even more importantly, has provided it in plain English so that people who are not specialists in this field, like you or I, can go and read it, look at the evidence, and um, make up our minds uh, whether 
this is or is not a uh, a credible rendition of the facts. And and what one of the um, I would say aspects of the blueprint Israel is implementing for the genocide in Gaza is the attack on Anorwa. Last week, Israel, of course, um, banned UNRWA. And this week, they issued a letter to the UN saying that they would stop all their cooperation with Anorwa. But there's been a backlash from that. Some of it, I would say, quite disingenuous because uh, they're saying, oh, if you close down Anorwa, then it'll be catastrophic, you know, for the Palestinians, as though there isn't a catastrophe already, as though there isn't a plan already to manufacture, create, or, or there, as of this isn't by design, you know, somehow. Uh, but in any case, what, what's been the response? I mean, I know Norway, for example, is seeking to add Israel's attack on Honor as part of the ICJ case on genocide. So uh, speak to us a bit about that as well. Well, my understanding is, is that Norway is engaging in a separate initiative which is to seek a further advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. The idea would be that um, the General Assembly would request a binding advisory opinion from the court on the legality of Israel's um, uh, measures against UNRWA. I think there's two comments that need to be made here. The first is that um, Israel's campaign against UNRWA needs to be understood in its broader context. This is a campaign along with Israel's acolytes, for example, in the U.S. Congress and on the European far right, that have consistently targeted UNRWA for everything under the sun. Um, but their target is not necessarily UNRWA itself, um, by which I mean that for them, UNRWA is the most visible surrogate of the Palestinian refugee question as a whole. And they believe that if they can somehow get rid of UNRWA, they can get rid of Palestinian refugees. Um, they can um, get rid of the Palestinian refugee question. So they come up with all these hoaxes, such as, you know, Palestinian refugees alone um, are uh, the descendants of Palestinian refugees are unique in that they and they alone are defined as refugees, as if Somalis and Afghans um, uh, and, and others in similar situations aren't also so defined. You know, the whole campaign against um, uh, supposed inefficiency and corruption uh, by UNRWA, and most recently, uh, these allegations that uh, UNRWA is actually a subsidiary of, of Hamas and, 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 and so on. So that's one part of it. The other part of it, is um, as so often, Israel doesn't just barge in and and um, uh, take extreme measures. It has a consistent practice of starting with a trial balloon. So what it has done here is it has announced uh, that it has informed UNRWA that I believe after 90 days, um, all relations with uh, between the Israeli government and UNRWA will be severed that it will revoke and renounce its 1967 agreement pursuant to which UNRWA could continue operating in the occupied territories. And it's now waiting to see in, in the, what happens in the next 90 days. You know, will the U.S. trot out John Kirby and Matthew Miller um, uh, to emphasize Israel's right to defend itself? Um, will the European Union suffice with expressions of, of grave concern and look the other way as Israel has its way uh, with UNRWA? Or will the um, Norwegian initiative in the General Assembly succeed and not only produce a binding advisory opinion pursuant to which Israel um, must allow UNRWA to continue operating, but is will it also be a binding advisory opinion that UN member states will actually take measures to enforce. And based on that, Israel will, will move either forward or backwards. And, and as, as we discussed um, last week also, I think, you know, the skill of the UN, uh, of the Israeli campaign against the United Nations, you know, whether it's a secretary general, UNRWA, um, uh, other UN women and other bodies is really without precedent since the world body was established in 1945. Yes, you know, many states 
have um, uh, taken measures against um, uh, the UN or one of its agencies here or there. But the idea that a national parliament adopts a resolution defining a UN agency as a terrorist organization and then adopts a, a further parliamentary resolution effectively outlawing that agency is, is to the best of my understanding without um, uh, without precedent. And again, this has happened not only because Israel's Western sponsors and allies have decided to suffice with at most um, uh, verbal expressions of concern, knowing full well that Israel understands that verbal protests means no protest and that it can continue. But even the UN itself, I mean, in the person of its Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has been going, has been walking on eggshells for months, you know, lamenting the deaths, the unprecedented kill, um, deaths, as he would put it, of UN staff, without even identifying who is killing them, um, uh, uh, you know, constantly seeking to appease Israel, and only recently beginning to grow a spine and call out Israel for its conduct. Well, unfortunately for him, it's proven too little too late. I guess what happens when you're drunk on impunity, drunk on power, yep. uh, you can exactly you, you can <laughs> um, attack the UN and all its bodies and you know make all kinds of justifications. Um, but you can also, I guess, uh, carry out psyops against um, against your um, so-called allies in the West, and that's exactly what I think has been happening with our next story, which is um, to do with Israel. Uh, releasing information um, to torpedo the um, any kind of negotiation to release the hostages and peace deal. Um, that's a scandal that's been uh, unfolding in, in Israel over the past week. We spoke about this, I think, two months ago, uh, where uh, Jewish Chronicle in the UK and the German Bild published articles in favour of Benjamin Netanyahu's narrative that... Um, um, the hostages, uh, well, Sinwar was thinking of planning to take the hostages out of Gaza into Iran, uh, which gave Netanyahu a justification to keep control of the Philadelphia corridor and his position on the hostages. And and now it turned out that that was all fake. Uh, one person has been arrested, as far as I, 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 I can tell. In I believe it's five at this point. Oh, so five <laughs> people have been arrested. So this is a scandal that's unfolding, um, and and you have to ask, you know, the U.S. has constantly had the position that it was Hamas that did not want a hostage deal, and Israel was completely for it. Now it turns out not only was Israel against any kind of hostage deal, they were creating narratives and stories, planting stories in the Western press to uh, to torpedo any kind of uh, negotiation hostage deal. Well, the background to this is that over the summer, um, uh, negotiations over a resolution of, of um, uh, let's call it the crisis in Gaza, uh, for those who take these negotiations seriously, um, uh, appeared to be stuck on a key issue, excuse me, namely um, uh, whether or not as part of any agreement, Israel would fully withdraw from the Gaza Strip, meaning it would withdraw not only from the Netzarim Corridor, which we were discussing earlier, but also what Israel calls the Philadelphia Corridor, uh, the border zone between the Gaza Strip and, uh, and Egypt. And secondly, uh, it was becoming increasingly apparent that the main obstacle, if not the um, only obstacle to reaching an agreement was Israel in the form of its prime minister, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, who, as you may remember, kept adding new conditions and moving the goalposts and so on. And then all of a sudden, these articles began appearing um, uh, in not only the Israeli press, but in two of, of the Israeli rights uh, favored foreign outlets, the Jewish Chronicle in the UK, and built in uh, Germany, where you began to see these stories that um, uh, Israeli intelligence 
had discovered documents that uh, Yahya Sinwar, uh, the, the Hamas leader in the Gaza Strip who has since been killed, was planning on escaping from the Gaza Strip along with the hostages, presumably bordering, boarding a commercial airliner in, in Cairo airport and flying with these hostages, uh, you know, across Sinai, Jordan uh, and Saudi Arabia uh, towards uh, towards Iran, where he was going to keep these hostages. And then other stories began appearing that, in fact, um, uh, these negotiations were proving fruitless because Yahya Sinwar, as a matter of principle, uh, was not going to sign any deal because he was convinced that the longer the Palestinians held on, the greater the likelihood that a regional conflict uh, would erupt that would increase his leverage in any future negotiations uh, with Israel. And, and, and the important thing about these stories is that they were based on supposedly um, uh, documents that had been produced by Hamas or by Sinwar personally that Israeli intelligence had managed to capture in the Gaza Strip and that were now being leaked um, uh, to these two favorite publications of the Israeli right in, uh, in Europe. We've since then had the scandal with the Jewish Chronicle in which um, the journalist who published these stories turned out to be not a journalist um, uh, at all. But more recently, it has emerged that in fact, these documents were deliberately being leaked by um, uh, very close associates of the Israeli prime minister himself. And um, there have now been four arrests and the somewhat comical aspect of this is, is that several of the people arrested who are um, uh, who were accused of leaking these documents, in fact, work for that unit of Israeli intelligence, which is responsible for preventing leaks. And it turns out that they're the ones who have been leaking this. So the, the long and short of the broader context here, of course, is uh, Netanyahu attempting to frame the narrative um, uh, so that he can kind of uh, escape responsibility for being the one sabotaging and preventing an agreement that would end the war in the Gaza Strip and see the release of Israel's uh, captives uh, being, being held there. And there is also apparently an intelligence aspect to this, which is that the, those investigating these leaks are saying that although some of these documents were um, uh, doctored, they do have the potential to expose Israeli intelligence sources and methods or, or something to that effect. And the final point I would make is that the International Crisis Group analyst, Meirav Zonshein, has pointed out that there's really nothing new here, that Netanyahu does this all the time within Israel and is in fact on trial in Israel for exactly these kinds of dirty tricks. Um, but that what is different here, uh, what is new here, is that such information is now being leaked to um, uh, foreign uh, media outlets. And, and of course, you know, a, a magazine uh, like Bild, which is essentially a stenographer for the Israeli government or the Jewish Chronicle, were very willing uh, victims uh, in, in this case. And, and, and it's, you know, I think quite likely they knew exactly what they were doing. The broader, final broader point here is there have been so many stories over the past year in the Western mainstream media, you know, whether you're talking about the Hamas Pentagon under Ed Shifa Hospital um, or all, you know, Yahya Sinwar being surrounded by uh, uh, hostages uh, as using them as human shields and all the rest of it. So many of these stories that claim to be based on Hamas documents captured by the Israelis and being made available to star correspondents of some of the leading Western media. Will these now be revisited now that we know exactly what has been going on? 
I don't think they will, unfortunately. I think these media will simply stand by their stories, tout their own professionalism, and move on to the next story based on leaked and fraudulent uh, material provided by, uh, by the Israeli intelligence services or the Israeli prime minister's office to them. We spoke, in the case of Gaza, we spoke about systematic destruction, systematic starvation, systematic killing. And I think we need to add to that the systematic uh, journalistic malpractice um, oh, yes. ac across the West. That's another thing, one we should add to this story. And that takes us neatly into my penultimate story, which is um, 100 journalists in the BBC uh, writing and complaining, protesting to the BBC's coverage. And that is connected to the um, Jewish Chronicle. I mean, one, one of the owners of the Jewish Chronicle, um, he actually sits on the, some kind of oversight committee within the BBC. Robbie Gibb. It was to monitor, you know, um, um, impartiality. I mean, and this is a guy who's, who's also the owner of the Jewish Chronicle. So it shows how deep this goes, um, uh, the, the matter of practice goes, that is. So I just, I, just I, go, go on, sorry. No, please, go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to speak to that and also um, uh, comments by Day, uh, British Foreign Secretary David Lammy, because I want to skip through this quite quickly while I get to the US elections. Yeah. David Lammy, we, we, we should mention this because last week he said in, in Parliament, in response to a question that, um, no, um, we should not describe what's happening in what's happening in Gaza as genocide. It undermines, demeans the use of the word genocide because when we think of genocide, according to Lamy, it means, you know, we apply this term to people and a million people are killed. Yeah. And, yes, and I mean, been... if, unless, unless there are six million victims, unless the victims are Jewish and unless the perpetrator is Germany, it doesn't qualify as genocide. It's completely wrong, of course. I mean, uh, I actually wrote a piece, but so many other people have condemned him. Um, I think people within his own party kind of thought, of, how can you make that comment for someone who sits, who is the foreign secretary to make such a blunder? It's it's quite outrageous. Uh, well, well, let's be clear what, what Lamy is doing. He's he's basically engaging in genocide denial. He's, according to his criteria, Rwanda, where I believe something on the order of 800,000 people were slaughtered. Sorry is no longer a genocide. Srebrenica um, uh, in Bosnia, where um, uh, 8,000 people were killed, and which was um, uh, really the only incident in the Yugoslav wars that was explicitly identified as genocide by the International uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and by the International Court of Justice. That is no longer a genocide. And the reason that Lamy is engaging in genocide denial um, of, of things that every three-year-old understands to be a genocide. The reason Lamy is engaging in this um, uh, really, let's call it disgusting uh, genocide denial, the reason he's doing that is so that he can maintain defend Israel's genocide in the Gaza Strip. In other words, once again, historical truth um, the sanctity of the memory of the victims of Rwanda and Srebrenica and elsewhere is being sacrificed on the altar of Israeli um, uh, impunity. Turning just briefly to, to, to the BBC, my understanding is that Robbie Gibb is not actually the owner of the Jewish Chronicle. Rather, he's the front man who refuses to reveal who the actual owners of the Jewish Chronicle are because it was... You're right, but the reason because there's so much confusion around this, and I think this intentionally uh, manufactured confusion uh, to pin down exactly what his role yes. is. But he's yeah, refusing, and he's refusing to, to come clean. I mean, the yeah. guy is uh, a, a study in obfuscation. Nevertheless, he's also emerged as a BBC's chief commissar um, when it comes to uh, reporting uh, on the Middle East, of course, very ably assisted by Tim Davey and various others in the corporation. And, um, you know, for all the criticism of, of the BBC, let's not forget, uh, it's, it's an organization that has many highly professional and dedicated and committed journalists, which, which has um, uh, a storied history. And I think these people um, don't like the way that their organization, to which they've dedicated so much of their professional careers, has become somewhat of a laughingstock 
during the past year because of the way that it's dealing um, with um, uh, with with uh, genocide in Gaza. I mean, we've all seen these bizarre interviews, you know, where every time a guest mentions genocide, he's berated by the, he or she is berated by the um, uh, BBC presenter who rattles off a whole list of Israeli talking points. I mean, it's almost, you know, being interviewed by the BBC has become somewhat akin to an interrogation by the Shin Bet. Um, and, and, and so these 100 journalists joined by others have written a letter of protest uh, to management saying that things have to change, you know, that, um, it, that it needs to be, for example, that listeners and viewers need to be regularly informed that the BBC, and for that matter, all other international media, is being systematically prohibited uh, from entering the Gaza Strip and reporting the story from the site. Um, that when Israeli hacks and apologists make claims live on air without any evidence, it should they should be challenged to provide evidence, or it should be um, uh, noted that they haven't produced any. But of course, today, you know, the BBC, we were talking earlier about casualty figures and the credibility of the um, uh, Hamas, uh, of the uh, Gaza Ministry of Health, which of course operated uh, for almost two decades under the Hamas government. In BBC speak, uh, thanks to Commissar Rabi Gibb, you're no longer allowed to say Gaza Ministry of Health. It now has to be Hamas-run Ministry of Health to kind of undermine its credibility before even providing in any of its figures. Um, we also see um, systematically BBC, Palestinians aren't killed, they die. The identity of, of, of their murderers is simply never, uh, very rarely uh, explicitly identified. The passive voice has become dominant on the BBC uh, when it comes to Palestinian casualties, whereas, uh, you know, emotional uh, tones uh, and so on are dominant when it comes to Israeli casualties. And, and it's these kinds of things that these journalists are protesting against because, you know, their own professional reputation is at stake. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine 100 staffers being watching what they've been seeing for the past year, uh, systematic genocide. And then you have the BBC motto of impartiality, neutrality, uh, being fair and balanced. Where does that lie when you have on the one side genocidal rhetoric, uh, execution of genocide. On the other side, people who are just saying international law, we want basic human rights. Where does neutrality lie in that well, situation? Well, and, I would just say things at the BBC have gotten so horrifically bad that if they were to treat the party committing genocide and the victims of genocide equally, if that's their definition of impartiality, to treat them as equally valid, even that would be a huge step in the right direction for Robbie Gibbs, BBC. Hmm. Let's end with a, a discussion about the US election. Um, US voters will be voting tomorrow. Uh, whether it's um, Trump or Harris, we'll know hopefully by Wednesday if there isn't any um, challenge. Um, what, what, just wanted, first, let's start. You know, what's your thoughts on that uh, in terms of how? It may impact on the uh, Palestinian issue. Uh, I suspect it won't have much of an impact, but you sent issued a long tweet um, following a, I think, a discussion or an event you were part of. Uh, when I look at the US elect, people have described this as being a, um, a high stakes election. And when I see someone like Elon Musk, who has spent the past six months making the case that this is the election which is where US democracy is on the line. If the Democrats win, then this is the end of the US. Yeah. This is the end well, of the US constitution. When you say stuff like that, then you're almost calling for violence. That's what it sounds like to me. If the results don't go your way, then you are you are almost say, look, this yeah. the, the result is rigged somehow. Yeah, just like in the good old days of uh, white minority rule in uh, South Africa, where, uh, where Musk grew up. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, so you're, do you think, I mean, it, it, any, there's any difference between uh, Biden, uh, sorry, um, Harris and uh, Trump? I mean, Trump did say reportedly that uh, he told Netanyahu that he wants the genocide of the war in Gaza, in his word, 
to be finished before he comes into office. So which suggests that, you know, he he, he wants to take a different course. Well, there's there's several issues here. Um, first of all, I, I don't want to get into uh, the domestic consequences of of uh, the selection. Um, you know, that's something that will affect, I think, um, uh, mainly Americans. And if the best they can come up with is either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, uh, all power to them. I, I would just uh, I would just know that in the United States, you don't have to win a majority of the votes to win the election. In fact, there have been multiple um, uh, elections, presidential elections in the past two decades where the successful candidate has lost the popular vote but ends up in the White House. That's you know the democracy that they're trying to teach um, uh, the rest of us. Regarding Palestine and the region, I think there are two separate issues. The first is the end of the Biden administration. And the second is um, any distinctions between Harris or Trump. So um, I think the election is significant in that it signals the end of the Biden administration. And I think it's fair to say that the level of fanatic devotion, um, and I use that term advisedly, that Biden has shown towards uh, Israel is unlikely to be equaled by either Harris or Trump. Um, and what that means is, and I think this is also how Israel sees it, and that from Israel's perspective, it has had unique opportunities uh, during the Biden administration, and the clock will run down on January 25th, 2025, when Biden is wheeled out of the White House and, and his uh, successor replaces him. I mean, you've, you know, I've, I've seen Israeli press reports that even Israeli leaders have been taken aback at how far they have been able to go uh, for how long without the United States, as it tends to do in such situations, eventually interfering and saying, game's up. There has been none of that here, whether in terms of the genocidal campaign in the Gaza Strip or um, the regional escalations that have now brought us to the brink of an Iranian-American uh, direct uh, military confrontation. So the fact that Israel sees Biden's departure as a significant political moment means that the period between today and January, irrespective of the uh, election's result, is, in my view, a period of maximum uh, danger. The other part of it concerns distinctions between um, Trump and uh, Harris. And here I think it's, it's a more difficult uh, question to answer. I think it's probably fair to say that Harris, should she um, come to occupy the White House, will revert to the traditional American position of unconditional support for Israel, but with certain limits placed where Israel's conduct is seen by um, Washington's elite as um, contradicting or undermining uh, core US national security interests. With Trump, um, it could go either way. You you mentioned um, that this phone call where he is supposed to have told uh, Benjamin Netanyahu that I want this file closed by the time I enter the White House if I win. That strikes me as entirely plausible, uh, given that Trump, an important part of his base, consists of isolationists, uh, given that he has denounced his both his Republican and Democratic predecessors of, la of launching forever wars in the Middle East. And Trump is not probably not someone who wants to um, start his term by getting engaged in a land war in the Middle East, uh, in Iran or anywhere else. So the idea that he has sent a clear message to Netanyahu um, to wrap this up before January is entirely plausible. But it's equally plausible that um, uh, Trump will take US intervention in the region to entirely new heights. And so here's Israel's problem. Um, while Trump, while, while Israel 
perhaps alone in the world in terms of the available public opinion polling, has an overwhelmingly expressed preference for Trump over Harris. And while Trump at the rhetorical level has aligned himself much more closely um, uh, with Israel, he's also seen quite rightly as erratic and unpredictable and unreliable. And therefore, Israel is not going to wait until January um, to do its worst. It's going to do that before January because of Trump's unreliability. Harris is practically seen as an enemy by Israel. I mean, that's how far off the reservation Israeli elites and public opinion um, uh, have uh, have gone. You know, the kind of unconditional, traditional unconditional support of Israel with certain limits is, is viewed as uh, hostility, is viewed as uh, seeking um, to, end, uh, to end Israel's viability as a state. And the only other comment um, I would make is, is that it's very unlikely that the next U.S. president, whether Trump or Harris, will prove to be even more pro-Israeli than Biden has been. I don't think that's even possible. Um, the other thing with regards to the U.S. elections is there is, of course, the uh, looming threat by Iran saying that they will retaliate um, in following Israel's uh, attack uh, last uh, just I think two weeks ago now. Um, that, does it matter who who wins in the US, uh, whether um, Iran uh, retaliates or not? I mean, Trump is seen as someone who would take more of a hawkish line on Iran, given that he pulled out of the nuclear deal which uh, that was struck by uh, President Obama. So um, maybe the Iranians will uh, look at this and think, OK, if Trump wins, we should really uh, be careful how we respond to the Israeli strike. I mean, what's your take on that? Well, it's, it's said that um, uh, that the Iranians have made a decision to retaliate against uh, Israel's recent uh, air attacks on Iran and that the reason for their delay in, in retaliating is that they did not want to do anything in the run-up to the election that could be seen as bolstering Trump's re-election um, uh, chances. And many people have, have now for at least uh, several days been saying that an Iranian response to Israel's recent attacks appears increasingly likely and increasingly imminent. Um, and the fact that it hasn't yet come, in my view, suggests that the Iranians, while not necessarily expressing any preference um, uh, for Harris, did not want to engage in any action that could be seen as potentially uh, bolstering Trump's election uh, chances. In my view, the most likely date for such an attack, and here again, I'm only speculating, is the day after the election. First of all, because it comes after the election and then the Iranians um, can't be accused of having done anything uh, to influence um, uh, the ballot, but also because November 6 is the 40th day after uh, the Israeli assassination of uh, Hezbollah's general secretary, Hassan Nasrallah. And of course, the 40th day is, is an important commemoration. And that's a day on which we may well see some kind of uh, combined um, uh, combined attack, combined initiative by Iran, Hezbollah, and uh, potentially others. But just to get back again very briefly to your question, I think the key issue um, uh, with Iran is not the different approaches Trump or Harris would take. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will be differences um, here and there, but the transition from the current administration, that of unconditional indulgence of, of Israel, and in effect, allowing Israel um, to take the lead in uh, setting U.S. Middle East policy, and a next um, uh administration where whether Trump or Harris is probably going to uh, be more assertive about um, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, setting setting terms. Thank you, Moin. It's a pleasure speaking to you. Um, and uh, 
Likewise. Hope to see you again next week. And uh, thank you all for tuning in and listening to our weekly review with me, Nassim Ahmed, and Moan Rabbani. Bye-bye.